Hi everybody, it is Wednesday 101, I'm one minute late. I um, hope everybody's having a good day. We're halfway through another week. Um, today we're reading chapters 23 and 24, and we're also just two days away from our next pizza lunch. Um, so 1, 1 p.m. Central Time, which is the time right now, um, we will be meeting uh, for lunch. Bring your lunch, there's a Zoom link. Um, and if you're in any of the Facebook fan groups, you'll find the sign up form. Five fans will win a pizza at their door and the rest of us will bring our lunch and we can all see each other and chat. And this week, Charlie Case and TR Cameron are going to also be there. So you can um, meet them and ask questions or chat and see what they're like. And, um, for now, um, Wild Child Lois is at daycare running with the big dogs. Lois, Leela's asleep on the couch. I could hear her running in her sleep a little earlier. And um, Lois will be back tomorrow to bark behind me. Um, the weather here is great, and the Lyric Chronicles are coming along well. So we've got the ground warm age, um, firing on all pistons. Tomorrow, um, which is a Prestor Street 7, finally comes out. Magic Unbound, I think. Um, and uh, hello, Grace. Hello, Diane. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Mike, the regulars. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, and let's get to it. Chapter 23 of War Mage Unexpected, book one from the Never Ending War series. By the way, um, I'm torn between doing uh, book two from the Lyric Chronicles for the next book we read or doing the Daniel Codex, which is a personal favorite of mine, and I don't think enough people ever discovered it. So we can talk about that later. Anyway, chapter 23. Morning keeps coming too early. Henry rubbed his eyes and greeted Raven by the gate of the Aubrey Ranch. You're not limping as much. Feeling better? She shrugged. It's starting to loosen up. Not 100%, but it's getting there. The good news is I feel not so bad this morning. I'm hoping that's a good sign. They began walking down the road, Henry smiling up at the sky. Nice to see the sun back out and shining. Things dried up pretty fast. Raven stomped her boots, loosening a little more of the dried mud off the sides. Yeah, thank goodness. One gully washer a year is plenty. Tell that to the crops. Glad I don't have to grow anything out here. Your dad's a farmer. You want to learn how to make haystack itself. Like I said, not farming yet, and I'm hoping magic will really change things up. Hey, did you give any thought to what I said last night? You mean figuring out how to train a dragon and also get him to want to be my familiar? About a million different ways, but it's not all up to me. I've given up on the idea of a dragon for a familiar. Why? He didn't say no. Bonus points. It would be badass to bring a dragon to Fowler. That would be seriously impressive. Yeah, but that's not why I'm doing this. Since I was a little girl, I felt like I was destined for something great. She tapped her chest. I can feel it. I know that. You've talked about it plenty of times. But I never really knew what that great thing was. In Brighton, one of the greatest things you can be is a member of the military. Look at the treatment draftees get. And they don't even do anything in peacetime. She moved along at a faster clip, forgetting her aches and pains, caught up in the dream. Her long red hair was caught up in a braid, swinging across her back. I thought I could fight to protect the city, too, but I don't want to just walk around in a spotless uniform and get free beer down at Wrangler's. I want to see action. Her hands were curled into fists. Henry shook his head. What does this have to do with training a dragon? She picked up a stick and swung it around like a sword. Have you ever flown on the back of a dragon? I've never felt like that about anything before. I was connected to everything. You could do anything from the back of a dragon. Be a real hero. Protect the city from the sky like a, like, a, like a war mage. You're the best witch I've ever seen. And if the rest of the city could see the spells your grandfather's already taught you. Raven's eyes widened and she took a quick look around to make sure no one was close enough to hear. You know that's got to be a secret, she hissed. He wasn't supposed to be teaching me outside of the academy. Relax, no one can hear us. Henry took a slingshot out of his back pocket and picked up a stone, aiming at a nearby pine tree, hitting it squarely in the center. The tree shook and pigeons roosting in it took flight. You impressed Headmaster Flynn on the first day of Academy, 
and you aren't even like challenged by it. It comes easy to you. He picked up another rock and aimed it at the birds taking flight, the rock falling far short. Raven took a sidelong glance at her friend. Is that a problem for you? You know, I believe in you too. No, look, I'm happy for you. That's not my point. Everybody makes mistakes, right? I mean, the front lawn of the school yesterday looked like the island of misfit toys. He shook his head. I had a nightmare last night that I was being chased by a bat with two heads. Elizabeth swore that was a mistake. Was it? Was it? Raven giggled. Later, she tried to levitate a pile of stone and set them on fire instead. Still not sure that wasn't on purpose either. I know, I'm keeping an eye on her. Henry laughed. Did you see Rory fade half of himself into the shadows? Henry's shoulders shook from a shudder. A pair of legs kept asking me for half my sandwich. What part scared you more, the legs or him trying to bogart your sandwich? Thought so. I noticed all the upperclassmen eating their lunch outside this past week. It's cheap entertainment for them. Professor Ridley told me it was necessary to learn a little humility before we learn any dark arts or practice weaponry in groups. That's the point I'm making. Raven frowned, the magic inside of her running down her arms. It was always at the ready when her emotions got the better of her. Raven, you do see that you got a head start. Hardly seems fair. He picked up another stone and hit a small branch 10 yards away, breaking it off. You didn't make any of those mistakes. You're already a pro. I've just had more practice. I'm not better than you are, just ahead of you, for now. She pressed her lips together, not wanting to say anything about the pulse of magic she felt at times. Not sure anyone would understand. He picked up two stones, shooting off one after the other, hitting a sign and pivoting quickly to hit a post, irritating the crow sitting on top. The bird spread its wings, rising into the air amid a loud chorus of squawking. It's more than that. It's like you have a feel for what to do. You're not used to really struggling to learn something. This dragon has your number and it's two. He's number one. She sighed. I do like to be the one in control. That's why you're getting frustrated. This dragon is an impossible to deal with. You have to push yourself to be better than you've ever been. And that's hard for someone who's naturally the best at everything. Maybe he's right. They reached the town center and Raven stopped at the bulletin board covered in a new layer of flyers. Damn, Henry, check this out. Henry shot a pebble at the board with a slingshot. Another bullseye. What? Are we ever going to walk through the square without you stopping to look at something? I want to hear the announcements. You want to find a seat next to Jenny. So what if I do? Raven flipped through the few new papers. It's not a lot, but these are all new. It's too many to be ranch hands moving on to another city. Henry put his finger through the holy maid, glancing at the papers. I don't know what normal looks like for these. Maybe it is. She scanned the names. No, this is too many. Harriet Easton stepped out of her wooden frame house with a fading whitewash, pressing her hand to her tired back. She looked down the road and shook her head, pulling her door shut tight behind her with a click. Don't believe everything you hear, Raven, she called out, shaking her finger. Morning, Mrs. Easton. Raven chased after a paper that had come loose and was twirling in the wind. Mrs. Easton adjusted the scarf tied around her wiry gray hair and leaned over to pick up a pail of dirty water, dumping it into the road. She set the bucket down and wiped her hands on her muslin apron. Those disappearances, you're buying into all the terrible stories out there. You have a theory? Henry leaned closer to Raven and muttered, we're going to be late. You keep doing this and I'm walking to school on my own tomorrow. Harriet sighed as she picked up the bucket. Sure do, about 15, no, 20 years ago. Yeah, about the time my first grandchild was born. No, or it was when I took that long trip to Brighton, the city was attacked. Ma'am, we're going to have to move along, Henry pleaded. Raven rolled her eyes and grabbed Henry's hand, dragging him over to Mrs. Easton's stoop. What am I supposed to not believe? Okay, I'll play along, whispered Henry. Ma'am, there are no records of any attack that recent. All the battles and wars that were fought happened a long time ago. She scoffed at both of them. What are they teaching you kids? Nobody bothered to remember it. She held out her hand in a flying beetle with a shiny, hard maroon shell lightly landed on her finger. Henry mouthed, a familiar, his eyes wide. There was a pack of bandits that lived to the west of us. Horrible, horrible people, ruthless, scum of the earth. Okay, and? Raven looked around, growing impatient. Raven, I knew I'd find you too. Murphy came around the fountain, strands of blonde hair stuck to her face. I had to run most of the way, she said. 
breathing hard as she caught up to them at the stoop. What are you? Mrs. Easton ignored the girl, waving her arms. The beetle extended its wings and buzzed around her head, lighting again on the top of her scarf. Henry watched transfixed. They were roaming around, stealing land from people, she shouted. Murphy looked from Raven to Henry. Did something happen? Murphy's cat leaped up onto the edge of the fountain, keeping its distance from everyone else. Not yet, but I'm hoping, said Henry. Look, a very small familiar. Raven nudged him while giving Murphy a wave. Are you okay? She asked her new friend. Yeah, I was hoping we could all walk to school together. They tried to steal land in Brighton. Yes, sir. Mrs. Easton was lost in her story. Got pretty far, too. Took over a couple of parcels of land, the Fuller Homestead and the Zeke Chicken Ranch. The beetle spun in a circle, hovering in one place, leaving a coppery trail of light. Come on, let's go inside, said Mrs. Easton. The beetle fluttered its wings, folding them in as it entered in, uh, into the lock on her door, pushing the tumblers and opening the door. What? That is amazing. I didn't know insects could be familiars. There are hundreds of possibilities. Henry looked around for anything crawling or buzzing. Focus over here, bug boy. Raven clapped her hands in front of Henry's face. What is happening, asked Murphy, looking at the ground for insects in the back of the shouting woman. Passerby glanced up at Mrs. Easton, but rolled their eyes and kept walking. Raven noticed and felt her shoulders drop. Henry was right in the first place. I've never heard of those landowners, have you? Asked Raven, looking at her friends. Murphy and Henry shook their heads. Of course you haven't. Those damn bandits came in here and killed the families, took over their land. Shame, too. The Zeke family had been in Brighton for a few generations. Everyone's gone now. You can find their headstones in the city grave near the back. I try to pull weeds from time to time. What did they do with the land? Henry asked, glancing in the direction of the academy. Murphy tugged at his sleeve. We need to get going. They tried to charge a lot of money for it, held it hostage, but they couldn't raise a dandelion without killing it. No skills, no talent, no upbringing. It all went to seed. It's open prairie now. Do you think the bandits are back? Raven waved the paper in her hand. What else could it be? I don't believe in boogeymen, but thieves and killers are real. Brighton is a peaceful little city where nothing happens. That's all, said Henry. We would have noticed strangers in town. Maybe you're right. Raven started to take a few steps away from the old woman. She was already heading back inside, still yelling at no one in particular. I'm telling you, I'm right, Murphy. Henry slung, slung an arm around her shoulder and gathered her closer, throwing his other arm around Raven. Two of my favorite people to walk me to school. Day starting off right. Only if we get to school in the next few minutes, said Murphy. What was that about? Conspiracy theories to go with these flyers. Raven held up the flyer of a farmhand who'd gone missing. Chapter 24. Hello, Bob. Hello, Diane. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Glad you're here. I'm sorry you were watching uh, something from three weeks ago, but you made it. And um, the Codex. Oh, yeah, Daniel Codex. Yeah, me too. I That's what I'm leaning towards is reading book one of Daniel Codex, partially because I think a lot of people would say, what's that? Um, but... Sign up for the pizza giveaway. Five fans will win a pizza delivered to their door. The rest of us can bring lunch to the Zoom lunch at 1 p.m. Central Time on Friday. And um, Charlie Case and TR Cameron will also be there to join in the fun. So I hope people come. Chapter 24. Raven slid into the old wooden desk set in an ornate metal frame and placed her hands flat on the surface, looking straight ahead. She was still breathing hard from the run up the circular stone steps, and her face was flushed. Murphy quickly slid into the desk next to her, a worried look on her face as she pushed her braids behind her shoulders. Her cat wove in and out of her feet, darting off to chase something moving in the corner. Hope that's not someone's gerbil familiar, muttered Henry as he passed by Raven, his head down. Everyone can still see you, said Raven, punching, punching his shoulder. We are so late, hissed Murphy, leaning over from her desk. Jenny was sitting behind her and patted her on the shoulder. Bella was on Raven's other side and gave her a nod and amused smile as she stuck her chin out. Raven turned her head away and looked out the far window. She could just see the tops of the barns and the rusted weather vane of stars and moons slowly turning. Henry had found a seat in the back and was huddling with his friends, slouched down in the seat. Raven glanced back at him and he shook his head, grimacing, sunk a little lower. 
Professor Bixby, a witch who was as round as she was short, was busy fussing with the collar of her black robe with one hand and pushing her frizzy brown hair back up on top of her head with the other. The mound of hair was being held in place by a dry fountain pen. Nope, not working, she muttered, turning in a circle, like that would help. The professor gave up, shaking her hands in frustration and clapped twice, looking up at the class. Who's ready to start? She glanced at Murphy and Raven, pursing her lips, but made no comment. Eager hands shot up and Bella shouted out, I am. Raven did her best to resist rolling her eyes and stared down at the carved initials all over the top of the desk. Some were so faded from years of hands rubbing across them that the letters were almost faded. Welcome to the History of Magic 101, a required course for all first year students at Fowler. You can't know where you're going if you don't know your roots. The teacher's voice was high pitched and she sang a lot of the words. Who knows the history of magic in Brighton? Raven could see out of the corner of her eye, Bella's hand waving in the air. She raised her own and sat up straighter. Miss Albie, you came late, but you came to play. Raven's face reddened and she slowly lowered her hand, not looking to either side of her. Yes, ma'am. Please enlighten us, sang the professor. The city was founded 500 years ago by a large group of witches and wizards traveling from the larger city of Wellington, located at the center of the trading routes on the other side of the mountains and past the last of the ancient trees. They settled here and established a new kingdom devoted to the safe use of magic. Professor Bixby tilted her head and gave Raven a smile. You did your homework. She tapped Raven's desk with her finger. Who in this classroom is related to one of the founding families? Hands shot up all around the room, including Raven Albee. Her grandfather had told her the story a thousand times when she was small. Both your parents were from lines of powerful mages, right? The professor gave her an encouraging smile, but Raven froze. She wants to be a dragon rider, said Bella evenly. What? But you're a mage in training. Raven did her best not to wince and glanced at Bella, narrowing her eyes. She looked back up at the vertically challenged professor who was right at her eye level. I want to be able to choose, Raven blurted out. The, ra the professor's forehead wrinkled, and she fussed with a pen in her hair, sending a cascade of fluffy hair around her head like a coppery brown halo. But we have a system, and it's been working rather well for a very long time. It's well known that magic is in your blood, passed down through generations, on down from your parents and grandparents to you. But don't we have any choices? Raven recognized Henry's voice from the back of the room and lifted her chin. He's ditching his resolution to hide, to stand up for me. I mean, who wants to know exactly what they have to be from the moment they're born, he asked. Professor Bixby waved a finger at him. The blood never lies, she sang, but over time, people often do. Has anyone heard of the family tree spell? Thank you, Miss Kinsley, can you tell the others? Elizabeth pushed her dark bangs out of her eyes, revealing a dark eyebrow against her pale skin as she rose out of her seat to give her answer. Her bat was hanging just underneath her desk, sleeping. Raven turned around in her seat to get a better look at Elizabeth and saw Henry shudder and shake his head. She covered her mouth to stop from laughing. Elizabeth held out her finger, a smile at the corners of her mouth. It's an old spell that takes a drop of blood on a piece of parchment that will build a family tree and reveal everything. Precisely, and it's our project for today. She pointed to the stack of parchment paper on her desk. Get a piece of paper and find a partner. She clapped her hands shouting, Lux et Literis. A swirl of sparkling gold appeared in the air, swirling in and out around the students. The professor giggled with delight, scooping up her hair and doing her best to secure it again. Miss Abby, you can pair up with Miss Chase, two strong mages from two old families. It could be fun to see if there's anywhere your lines cross, maybe your distant cousins. Both girls' eyes widened and they looked at each other surprised. B Bella began choking as Jenny thumped her on the back. Henry breezed by Raven, a smile on his face as he winked at her. Raven let out a sigh and went to get the paper, spreading it out across her desk. Bella stood next to her, still sputtering about not being an Albie. Is everyone ready? Hold out a finger over your paper and repeat this spell. Raven held out her finger and saw Bella's hand shaking. She looked out over at her face and saw the worry as Bella chewed on her lower lip. Raven let out a sigh and thought about Leander. It doesn't have to be about me. She reached out and took Bella's other hand and tried to smile at her. Bella looked confused, tried to pull her hand away, but Raven held tight. 
She leaned closer and whispered, I won't tell anyone, surprising Bella once again. Let this blood nourish the roots and speak for the generations. Familiae arbor revelatum est. Raven repeated the words carefully and felt a prick in her finger. A large round drop of deep red blood appeared and dripped onto the parchment below. Instantly it spread out, quickly creeping through the texture of the paper, creating lines and zipping from right to left. Names appeared, connected by more feathery lines with the descriptions printing underneath each one. Distracted, Raven let go of Bella's hand and leaned closer, surprised to see so many names she had never heard of before. Finally, near the bottom of the paper, she saw her mother's name. Tears shined in Raven's eyes as she waited to see Mage underneath her name. War Mage. Raven drew back with a gasp. What does that mean? What did you find? Are we related? Bella looked over at Raven's paper and saw the words under Sarah Abby. Mage. She straightened up and looked at Raven, one hand on her hip. Would you look at that? Professor Bixie is right. It's in our blood. You were meant to be a powerful mage, not a dragon rider. Raven was about to answer when there was a loud commotion from the cloud of boys near the back of the room. What is this? It says I'm related to a gnome. Rory Davidian was looking around the room, his head turning in every direction. Students crowded around his paper wanting to get a better look. Professor Bixby gave a loud tisk and clapped her hands. Clear the way. Did you add any words into the spell? No? Well, huh. It's only a third cousin. I imagine you'd be good if we ever got lost in a cave. Raven stayed back, staring at the paper in front of her and holding it closer to read the words more carefully. Sarah Abby, mage. Is my fate written in my blood? No, my grandfather believes in me. Raven stumbled out of the class, her head swimming with questions. She wanted to go home and find her grandfather, but there were more classes. And Leander, training, I have to go. Henry caught up to her in the winding hallway, carrying his parchment rolled up under his arm. Maxwell was calmly sitting on his shoulder, the long forked tongue flicking in and out as a fly, at a fly buzzing near Henry's face. Did you see what my tree said? A lot of the men in my line were great hunters. I'm more badass than I realized. He unfolded the paper, crowding the narrow hallway as students ducked under to get past him and hurry to the next class. Henry tapped the paper, holding it up in front of Raven. Do you see it? It would be hard to miss it. It says archer under most of them. Have you ever even fired off an arrow? No. Dad was always worried I'd shoot myself or hit my brother. I trip a lot. You're pretty good with that slingshot. You should give it a try. Maybe this will convince Professor Fellows to let me handle the weapons. He's got me in sword play with a wooden sword. He shook his head. That is not impressing anyone. Like Jenny. Like anyone. He rolled up the paper and put it back under his arm as they headed down the hallway. Everyone is talking about what yours said, but mostly because it said mage and you keep saying something about a dragon. Okay, just Bella and that upperclassman Daniel Smith were talking. You know, the one with the flying beanbag? He's got a thing for you. Talks about you constantly like I never met you, and he knows I've known you your whole life. Why is that my only choice? Raven. It's literally written in blood. Mage. No, if there was no chance, my grandfather would have stopped me. He would have said that it was impossible. Did you hear what I said? Daniel Smith. Even Bella loses the power of speech around him. I didn't know that was possible without a spell. They took the circular staircase back down, Raven running her hand along a row of the large granite blocks that held up the walls. Raven, he never told you, no, don't do it. It's a waste of time. Focus on the spells. He said that more than once. Well, he stopped saying. And he didn't stop you even after that dragon. Leander. Leander used you as his own human softball and threw you against the wall a few times. It's like you're teaching him about possibilities. Raven was quiet as they came through the large oak doors and turn right to head to the barns. Streams of students were passing back and forth, hurrying to the next class. Everyone heading to the barn was either pulling or carrying or leading an animal. Rory Davidian passed them with his owl flying on ahead, a small mouse caught in its talons. I'm not a gnome, he snapped at some, uh, he snapped at some upperclassmen who jostled each other, laughing as they disappeared into the building. Rory looked from side to side to see who was listening, but only ghostly pale Jacob Winters was glued to his side, as usual, a rat peering out of his jacket pocket. Jacob, is that your familiar? Are you sitting near Rory and his owl? Henry put out his finger to pet the rat's head. The rat bared its teeth and snapped at the finger. Henry drew it back just in time to avoid puncture wounds. Damn, protective much? 
The two boys snickered and laughed at Henry and hurried along to the barn. Raven was in no hurry to get there. The professor is going to make me sit on the sidelines and watch everyone. Bella will eat it up. Maybe I can head to Moss Ranch early. You can't start cutting classes. A certain someone is bound to notice and point it out. Starts with a B and ends with an H. That's not how you spell Bella. Oh, I think it is. Henry, she's not so bad all the time. I think she kind of paid me a compliment back there. She called me a powerful mage. They were almost to the barn. If you say so, come on. You'll live through class, said Henry. I'll let you hold Maxwell. True friend. Raven laughed and let out a sigh. Fine, I'll come and watch. It'll be good for you. Character building. Way to sell it. Okay, okay, I said I was coming. Maybe I'll learn what a toad can do as a familiar. You and me both. I've been trying to figure that out since Maxwell was a tadpole. Nothing yet. You're lucky. Dragons are easy. You can see everything they can do. Crush and incinerate. I envy your simple view of things. It's a lot more than that, said Raven, trailing in behind the last students into the cavernous barn. The rectangular windows that ringed the barn were all propped open to let the sunlight stream in and circulate the air. Pens ran along one side of the barn holding a variety of creatures, including a few smaller dragons, and on the other side were wooden bleachers already filled with nervous first years trying to hold on to their familiars. Henry pulled Maxwell closer, watching some familiars tugging at their leashes to get away and others cowering in their owner's arms. It's like a living food chain being played out in front of us. I think I'm gonna sit over here by the door, away from everyone. Suits me. Raven took a seat on the bottom bleacher nearest the exit, scanning the crowd for Bella. She spotted Murphy and Jenny on the far bottom row. Murphy's cat peeking out from between her feet under the bleachers. Where's the dragon? Raven looked up startled. Even though she already recognized the demanding voice, Bella Chase was standing over her, the fire drake perched on her shoulder. In my pocket, Bella, I've mastered making everything tiny. Hold still for a second and I'll demonstrate. Bella quivered just a little, but Raven still noticed and smiled, arcing an eyebrow. Time's not up yet, time's not up yet, Bella. Don't count me out. Bella stood back and looked Raven up and down. That's the last thing I do. I meant what I said. You're a badass kind of mage. You remind me of me just a little. But there can only be one queen on campus, and I'm filling the slot. Take it, Bella. Consider it yours. It's not why I'm at Fowler. Bella stood back, one hand on a hip, and seemed to be struggling to find anything to say. A tall, burly professor in a black robe, barely able to cover his arms, came striding into the barn and walked to the center of the room, clapping his meaty hands, causing an echo in the room. Julia Knowles came up to him, cuddling her furry gray wombat, and held it up for inspection. She barely came to his waist, even though she was one of the taller students in the class. He crouched down to get on her eye level and gently rubbed the fur on the wombat's head. He's the size of a tree. Raven tried not to stare as the professor stood back up, towering over Julia. That's Professor Worley. He's new to Fowler. Remember, I mean, excuse me, rumor has it he used to live in the forest with the animals, said Henry. Both Bella and Raven turned to take another look at him. It's true, or at least the rumor's true. Take your seats, chop, chop, we're wasting time. His voice rolled out in a low boom. Come on, Rodney, don't sit with your rabbit near Mr. Davidian's owl, sit over there. Thank you. Bella Chase, take your seat. You can show everyone just how smart you are in a little while. Bella's eyes widened as she turned on her heel without a word and marched to the middle of the bleachers and started climbing, glancing back at the teacher. The fire drake was flapping the edges of his wings and letting out short screeches, bouncing on her shoulder. A smile spread across Raven's face as Henry elbowed her in the ribs. We found two things that can render her speechless. I didn't even think one was possible. Proof of magic, laughed Raven. Henry Dirks, boomed the professor. Let's start with you and your toad. Step up front and center, young man. The color drained from Henry's face and he stood up, scooping Maxwell out of his pocket. He set his shoulders and blew out a short breath, marching to the center of the barn like a determined young wizard. All right, young Dirks, do you know what a toad can do as a familiar? Professor Worley crossed an arm over his chest, the other one rubbing his chin. Henry stood up straighter, holding out Maxwell, whose tongue was darting in and out, grabbing at gnats. He took in a deep breath as a hush came over the barn and a few students leaned in closer to catch every word. Professor Worley, sir? No, I do not. The bleachers broke into laughter and Henry pressed his lips together, looking helplessly at Raven, who shrugged, holding up her hands. I got nothing, including no familiar of my own. 
Professor Worley held up an arm, quickly gaining silence in the room. That's a very good answer, young, young Mr. Dirks. You will always do better among animals and magic if you can admit when you don't know something. I happen to particularly like toads as familiars. Wise choice, and says many good things about your character. Henry instantly relaxed his shoulders, a smile coming across his face. Raven gave him a thumbs up, even as Bella rolled her eyes. Raven noticed Murphy was the only one clapping her hands and cheering. The professor put his arm around Henry, pulling him neatly underneath. Toads are healing spirits. With a toad as you're familiar, you can strengthen any healing spell and fix more serious wounds. Heal more dangerous diseases. Just takes one good lick. Groans and laughter erupted from the crowd, but Henry never lost his smile. He held Maxwell up and kissed the toad's head as the professor patted him on the back, shaking him enough to make his teeth rattle. Back to your seat with you. Henry came back and sat down next to Raven. Well done, Maxwell. We showed them. Raven suppressed a giggle watching the frog flick its tongue. One by one, each student came up with their familiar and found out a new power about the animal. Some even got to practice mixing in a spell. Bella and her fire drink came and stood in the center and Raven watched, doing her best not to scowl. Hang on to your familiars, please. Professor Worley waved his arm, closing all the windows and the barn doors, leaving everyone in the darkness. Growls and yips and screeches could be heard rumbling around the bleachers. Okay, like you practiced it, Miss Chase, when you're ready. His voice could still be heard above the din. Et erit lux. Bella lifted her arm and the fire drake took flight, spreading its wings and sailing just under the rafters. Everywhere it flew, it left in its wake a stream of twinkling stars lighting up the barn with a soft but powerful light. Henry and Raven both looked up, their eyes wide. Wow, that is a good one, said Henry. Do you think your dragon can do something like that? I have no idea. There will be no living with Bella now, especially since you have Bupkis. She looked at Henry in the twinkling light. You've been hanging out with the wizard in the apothecary shop again, haven't you? Maybe. He knows a lot of weird spells. Raven looked around and realized everyone was distracted, including Bella. I can't take it. I'm sneaking out of here while I can. Bella will bust you. Probably, but I'm going to take a chance that this victory is enough for her today. Catch up with you later. Raven got up quickly and kept close to the wall, opening the tall door just enough to slide through into the afternoon light. Leander, we have to figure this out, she said, determined, as she headed across the campus toward the iron gates. Raven stood inside Leander's pen, her hands holding tight to the leather leaders. What if I say please? Then I'll reconsider toasting you like a sausage. You're not very good at bargaining. I'm a dragon bargaining with a girl in close range. I'd say I'm very good at it. You may want to reconsider. <coughs> the wind picked up, blowing across Raven's neck. A welcome relief from the hot air inside the pen. Leander lifted his head to smell the air, his heavy lids closing halfway as his large head turned in different directions. <coughs> Excuse me. The other dragons are in the next field. They've caught a few deer. Lunch is almost ready. That's an amazing and accurate sense of smell. Is that typical of dragons? Come on, don't ignore me. Every day we don't practice, we lost valuable time. Can I try putting a saddle on you? Trying is always an option. Can I do it without you throwing me into a tree? No. Raven shook her head. I appreciate the clarity. She put her hands on her hips. I'm going to sit here till you give in to something. Then get comfortable. Here, let me make you a little room. Raven turned in a circle, frustrated, as if she expected to come up with something better. But she threw up her hands and stepped closer, sitting down cross-legged, leaning her back against the dragon. Hope you like dragon kibble. It's what's on the menu tonight. I've had worse, said Raven, shutting her eyes for just a moment. She quickly fell asleep, curled up against the dragon. Leander watched her for a few moments and eventually curled his tail protectively around her, laying down his head and shutting his eyes. William passed by the pen and looked in his forehead wrinkling in confusion. Just when I think I've seen everything, he muttered, walking away, scratching his head. Raven Alby, you are meant to be around dragons, even if you are a mage. That is the end, that is the end of chapter 24, tomorrow chapter 25 and 26. Um, I hope you all are getting this kind of message that we get to choose our own destiny, even if nobody else believes in us. And that, um, the world has bigger things for us sometimes, but you got to be happy with who you are first, too. And you can still make friends with everybody, including Bella Chase. Um, I hope you all are doing okay, and 
um, I was going to say captivity, but it's really isolation. And you're finding things to do, and you're staying safe, and uh, your all your loved ones are as well. It is Wednesday, March 7th, March 6th. It was day off. Yesterday was Cinco de Mayo, so today is March 6th. And um, keep writing to me. I will write you back. Friday is lunch at Zoom. Enter if you want to win a pizza. Hope you all have a good day, and I will talk to you tomorrow.